Hi, and welcome to the 13th Annual Valley Disaster Preparedness Fair. My name is Marty Wall. I'm an amateur radio operator. My FCC call is N6VI. Now, I am not an electronics engineer or any other kind of engineer. I'm a retired CPA, but I've been working with electronics and radio for over 50 years. Today, we want to talk to you about preparing for power outages. First question, do you rely on electrical power? Well, you know, for millennia, humans got along fine without it. But our lifestyles today have put us in situations where we really do depend on it in many cases. The power grid we have is quite robust. Uh, it can be compromised, however, by a number of things. You could have a failure in a distribution hub, as we had back about uh, two and a half, three years ago. Uh, we had a, a fire in the central plant in Northridge from DWP, and in order to put the fire out, they had to de-energize almost all the San Fernando Valley. Uh, we certainly know we're in that season, we have wildfires. Uh, wildfires can damage the electrical transmission lines and take power out that way. We can have grid overloads in certain regions, you know, the rotating brownouts or blackouts. Uh, severe weather can certainly affect your, light, your power. You have lightning strikes that can take out a transformer. You have high winds that could topple a tree. The tree can hit the power lines and you're out of power there. Uh, for those who are not in the DWP area, some of the other electrical providers have what they call public safety power shutoffs, where in the high winds, they will shut the power off intentionally to prevent potentially fallen lines from starting a fire. And then of course, there are the rare but distinct possibilities of cyber or physical sabotage. What we're gonna try to do in this session is help you prepare for a power outage. And I promise we won't be doing any math. So what we're gonna talk about today are first, getting by using less power. Second, storing power with big batteries and running some of your key equipment from it. And then third, generating your own power. When we're talking about what you can get away without with electricity, we kind of have to separate into what's a convenience and what's a necessity. Uh, conveniences, I consider things like dishwashers, laundry appliances, cooking appliances, even electric can openers, entertainment devices, garage door openers. Now you compare that with some of the necessities we'll talk about in a bit, but these things you can work around. You know, get a sink stopper and a plastic tub so that you can do the dishes in your sink. Have a clothesline and have your hooks already installed in the appropriate places so you can put it out when necessary, dry your clothes. Have extra charcoal or propane on hand for your grill or your barbecue. If you have a gas stove, you think, well, okay, we don't need electricity, it's a gas stove or gas oven. But the problem with those is that they almost all now use electronic ignition. When you turn the knob on that burner and you hear click, 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 that's an electronic uh, starter. Uh, if you don't have that, it's just gonna keep, uh, the gas is gonna keep flowing, but you won't have uh, any flame there. So you can have matches or one of those little barbecue lighters and that will start the gas and you can cook inside. If you have an automated garage door, somewhere up along the track there, you have some handle and a, and a cord. You pull that, it disconnects the door, and you lift it up. However, the springs may be worn, the springs may be uh, damaged, and if they are, you may find that when you pull that handle and you're in a situation where the power's out and you have to evacuate, you lift that door, it could be 300 pounds. You're not going to lift it. So while we still have power, while we still have services, go and pull that cord See if you can reasonably easily lift that door, have it stay up. If not, call a garage door repair person, have them come and either replace or tighten the springs, whatever is appropriate. Uh, you should be able to lift that door up without too much trouble. And not only will that save uh, wear and tear on your garage door opener, it may save your life. So necessities, uh, we typically consider necessities uh, such as refrigeration, you know, keeping your food uh, safe to eat. Uh, cooling in extreme heat situations, lighting and security equipment, some basic communications, and for certain people, medical equipment. Let's look at what you can do with respect to refrigeration. I learned this in Hawaii when Hurricane Aniki came through and we were going to be without power for several days. You fill your refrigerator with as much ice bags and uh, blue ice and whatever you can to fill those voids and then you minimize the number of times you open the door. When you do open the door, 
Make sure that you do it quickly, get what you need, and close it up again. Every time you open that refrigerator or freezer door, you're going to have cold air falling out and warm air taking its place. So the less you open it, the better. If you have a well-insulated ice chest, get it out and have it ready. You can fill your ice chest with the more perishable items and some of those blue ices and bags of frozen water that you stuffed your refrigerator with. Good ice chest with good foam in it can keep the stuff cold for days. So that'll help you there. You should go to the Southern California Preparedness Foundation's food safety list. It's on the website. You can download it and it tells you what foods can remain safe without refrigeration for several days, which ones need to be kept cold. That's a free download. If you have a generator outside, and we'll talk about generators a little later, but make sure you have an extension cord that is both robust enough in terms of wire size and long enough to be able to reach out to where you're keeping the generator, well away from the house. As far as cooling goes, we understand that the summers in the valley can get very, very hot, and if you overheat, it can be dangerous. So, here are some workarounds if you don't have the power necessary to run air conditioning. Make sure you have several window fans or stand fans in your house. At night, open the windows, particularly upstairs windows, uh, which is where the heat rises to. Have a fan set up blowing out your exhaust. Have several fans in other rooms blowing in, which will help circulate that air, bring in the cool air, get rid of the warm air. If you have south-facing windows, try to block the sun from hitting them during the hottest, hottest part of the day. If you can cook outside, uh, such as with a barbecue or a grill, do that. It's less heat indoors. You can get a little portable air conditioner that can cool maybe one selected room. That can be your cooling room. You don't have to cool the whole house. Consider getting small personal fans and little pump-type misters. Those can help keep you cool as well. For lighting and security, uh, I would recommend you get some power loss lights in selected outlets. I have to have, happen to have an example right here. This one I picked up from SOS Supply. It plugs into one of your outlets, such as in a bedroom or in a hallway, and it just sits there uh, charging. And if the power goes out, the light comes on. You can find your way to the light. You can pull it out of the wall. It remains on. You can flip the switch and turn it into this kind of a flashlight. Having that can make getting around your house in a power outage at night much safer. Keep fl flashlights on hand, obviously. Uh, DC type lanterns, uh, those with LEDs or light emitting diodes are the most efficient. You'll get the most time out of them for your batteries. And make sure you stock up on those spare batteries. Now, uh, disasters on the East Coast tend to be predictable. They know when a hurricane's coming. They know when a flood is coming. They know when an ice storm is coming. Many of our disasters, such as earthquakes and wildfires, don't come with a lot of advance notice. So you should make sure that you have ready access to a flashlight. One I keep handy, actually two of them I keep handy, are right here. Uh, and one is a white light and one's a red light. And I can use these uh, just to see my way around until I can get to a bigger light if I need to. But having those with you all the time gives you that little added layer of protection. Um, do not use any fossil fuel based uh, lamps or lanterns indoors, such as your uh, white gas powered uh, camping lantern. Uh, those all generate uh, carbon monoxide and other byproducts. You don't want to use them indoors. Uh, use battery powered items. Basic communication. I know a lot of people have been getting rid of their landline phones. Uh, I know it's an annoyance to get all those robocalls, but landline phones have something very important going for them, and that is they are powered not by the electricity in your house, but by a battery bank, a very, very big battery bank at the telephone company's central office. The power is actually coming through the phone lines to run the phone. So in a power outage, a landline phone generally will still work. If you're using a cellular phone, make sure you have a DC charger available, one that can run from your car, for example. If you're using a smartphone, uh, they'll last for days if you're not using your screen all the time. Just to make calls, that's fine. 
But if you're using your screen intensively, if you have the brightness up, that's what eats up the battery power. So consider whether you really need to have that screen on most of the time. Now, speaking of cell phones, uh, the uh, towers that the cell phones connect to uh, typically only have a few hours, maybe half a day of battery power, if that. And if their power goes out, uh, then your cell phone won't be nearly as useful. So that's why I say hang on to one of those landline phones. Another great option is to have some FRS or family radio service radios handy. These are little UHF handhelds. You'll find them in blister packs of two or four at big box stores, sporting goods stores, and so on. They don't reach very far, but if you and your neighbors all have them, you can coordinate and have some communication around your block, your neighborhood, your office building, whatever it may be. Uh, I believe there's going to be another presentation sometime during this fair on the use of FRS radios. For some people, medical equipment is a life safety issue. If, for example, you have a CPAP machine to help you breathe at night, you need to keep that powered one way or another. If you have the option to get a DC power source for your CPAP, if it's sold by the manufacturer, I would encourage you to get one. If not, you can use a battery and an inverter combination, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, to produce a small AC power source, just like you would get out of the wall, but for low power devices that maybe will run it for an evening. Uh, if you have that generator, again, make sure you have a long enough and robust enough extension cord to reach out to where that generator is and you can run it that way at night. Some of the devices you have already run on DC. DC is direct current. It's not what comes out of the wall. It's what comes out of a battery, typically. If you think about your routers, cable modems, laptops, security cameras, video recorders, uh, two-way radios, almost anything is, that's a rechargeable device. They all run off DC. If you use one of these, that's producing DC. They plug into the wall. They convert the AC to DC. They reduce the voltage to what the equipment needs, and they power it that way. Let's take a look at one of those little adapters. Take a look at that red arrow on the left. It tells you what voltage comes out of the adapter. In this case, it's plus 12 volts. And then you see a solid line over a dotted line. That's the international symbol for DC power. And then it says 2A, 2 amps. That's basically how much electricity it can provide at that 12 volts. Now look at the little arrow on the right. You see that the diagram shows the positive is going to the center of one of those coaxial power connectors and the negative is on the shell. I'll explain in a minute why that's important. You can run a DC based device that runs on 12 volts directly from a 12 volt battery. You have a battery, you have a couple of clips, and you get a, an empty cord that has the right size of coaxial connector on it to match with the equipment that you're trying to run. And then you hook the appropriate leads to the positive and negative, clip on the battery, and your equipment's ready to go. Now let's look at another one of those little wall warts. <laughs> this one doesn't put out 12 volts, it puts out 9 volts. And look at that diagram below it. Where's the negative going? Not to the shell or the outside, it's going to the inside. And the positive's on the outside. So not all these things are created equal. You have to look and see what it is you're trying to match. Now if you need to run something with a power supply like this, you can still do it. Uh, this is called a DC to DC converter. I happened to find this image on eBay. Uh, it was going for probably $5 or less. And you see that little blue square in the lower right that says 9.0 volts? That's what this one produces. You put in 12 volts, you get out 9 volts. Now it'll only be a few amps, but it may be enough to run the equipment you need. Let's talk about inverters. I mentioned those a little earlier. Uh, an inverter takes 12 volts DC or 24 or any number of voltages and converts it to AC, that just similar to what would come out of the wall. If you use an inverter at all, you try to use one called a true sine wave inverter. Some inverters have a really ragged waveform and they're not very good for your equipment and they generate radio noise and they may generate heat in your equipment. A true sine wave inverter gives a pretty clean form of AC power that's very similar to what comes out of the wall. 
So now you're asking, well, gee, what kind of a battery should I be using? Let me tell you first what you shouldn't use. Don't use a starting lighting ignition or SLI battery, the kind that's under the hood of most cars. They're made to do one thing, and that is deliver a huge amount of current very quickly to turn that starter motor over and then get recharged right away. They're not made to be discharged over a long period of time. If you run it down and run it down, uh, and then you do that a couple of times, you're going to have to replace the battery. You'll damage it irreversibly. What you want is a deep cycle battery. A true deep cycle battery can be deep discharged many times. It's made with big thick lead plates, not the little lacy ones that are used in a starting lightning and ignition battery. Those batteries are designed to be run down, down to their empty voltage around 10.5 volts, charge back up, run down, charge back up many, many times. You'll typically find them in solar home situations where uh, you're using uh, off-grid, you're, you're charging up the batteries during the day with your solar and then using it to run your equipment at night. You'll find them on uh, boats and ships uh, where they don't have any source of AC. Uh, a good deep cycle battery can be discharged and charged hundreds of times. They're typically more expensive than a starting battery, but for the purpose that you want here, that's the right choice. Deep cycle batteries are rated by their capacity in amp hours or ampere hours. Now, don't confuse that with cold cranking amps. That's a rating for starting batteries. You don't want to use starting batteries. Now, you may have heard the old engineering joke, better, faster, cheaper, choose any two. Well, it kind of is that way with batteries as well. You could have high capacity, lightweight or inexpensive, choose any two. The most common types of deep cycle battery are lead acid. Now there are several different chemistries within those batteries, but they're all lead and acid one way or another. You have the flooded batteries which have uh, electrolyte sloshing around inside those plates, and you have uh, a lot of hydrogen being generated when you charge them up. This is one of the reasons you don't want to use them indoors, and frankly, I would avoid them altogether. There's a possibility of acid spills and so on. Uh, other types of uh, lead acid batteries that are much safer are AGM or absorbed glass mat and gelled electrolyte or gel batteries. They don't spill, you can operate them sideways, uh, they don't outgas with their charge properly, much safer to use and you can use them indoors. A great alternative to the lead acid battery is something called the lithium iron phosphate battery. Sounds like a mouthful, but these batteries, and by the way, these are not the same as the lithium polymer batteries that you find uh, lighting uh, uh, smartphones on fire or uh, uh, setting a BMW on fire when somebody charges their model airplane in the trunk. Uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries are very safe. They typically have a built-in battery management system that will watch for overcharge, under voltage, um, uh, short circuits, and so on, and shut the battery off if necessary. They can typically take thousands, not hundreds, but thousands of discharge cycles. Uh, a nice side benefit, they're about a third the weight of a typical lead acid battery. And as they discharge, the voltage is much more stable. It stays high enough to use during almost the entire discharge cycle. This isn't true with most lead acid batteries. They start at 13 volts and they work their way down. Well, if your equipment runs on nothing less than 12 and a half volts, part of that discharge for a lead acid battery won't be usable for you. The lithium iron phosphate battery holds that charge and holds that voltage pretty constant through almost the entire cycle. So you get much more usable power out of that battery. Um, I mentioned the trade-offs. Let's look at uh, the difference between these two. I have a, uh, a 96 amp hour gel cell, a uh, very well made one, company named DECA, D-E-K-A. It weighs about 70 pounds and it costs about $300 and you can have several hundred full discharge cycles with it. I picked it because it's the biggest one I could pick up with one hand, put in my car without hurting myself. But as I get older, even that gets to be a little bit of a challenge. The lithium iron phosphate 100 amp hour battery, so it's about the same capacity, only weighs 26 pounds. Now it weigh, costs about $800, but you can easily get one to 2,000 full discharge cycles out of it. 
So you can see that essentially you would replace that gel cell three or four or five times to get the same life that you would from a single lithium iron phosphate deep cycle battery. So when you look at it that way, even though the initial investment is pretty high, your cost to use it is really pretty good. So how big a battery do we need? Uh, I told you there'd be no math, so I can't really answer that specifically, but maybe a few examples will help. Here's the energy guide sticker on a typical small, fairly efficient refrigerator. And what it tells you is how many kilowatt hours down at the bottom will be used by this refrigerator in an average year. From that, we can come up with the average use per day. From that, we can figure out that you'd need roughly 160 amp hours of battery to run that refrigerator for one average day. Now that's a lot of battery. And we're talking about an average day, not a day when the power is out and you have no air conditioning in the house. And the refri refrigerator is working much harder to keep things cool when the outside temperature around it is much higher. So uh, is it practical to have enough battery capacity to run your refrigerator for several days? You know, maybe not. Here we have uh, maybe a floor lamp and a pair of table lamps and you've got them scattered around the house in key areas so that you have visibility at night. And let's say they all have an LED bulb in them and each one consumes about 16 watts. So with that, you'd need about four amp hours to run those lamps for each hour of runtime. So uh, if you want to run them for five, four or five hours at night, that would be about 20 amp hours of battery capacity. You use it up, if you can charge that battery, the next day, it's ready to go for another evening's worth of lamps on. Now, if you're not math phobic and you want to see what a power budget looks like, uh, down at the bottom I have a link to one that I prepared for use by amateur radio operators in running their equipment in a portable situation. Now, that's not necessarily as complicated uh, as it may seem, but it's probably more than you need. But you can at least see how the math is done. Um, Basically, a power budget will match uh, the loads that you have, that is, the devices that you need to run, with the various sources and battery storage that you have available. And for each of those devices, you're going to want to determine how many amps at 12 volts your device is going to use and for how long. So let's talk about battery safety. First, uh, batteries have a lot of energy stored in them. They're not high voltage, but they do pack a lot of power. So you have to respect that. Avoid metal jewelry that could possibly get in the way of those contacts. You know, leave your disco chains back in the drawer. Uh, don't use long metal tools that could reach both of those contacts at the same time. Try to protect the terminals from accidental contact. I use a couple of large PVC pipe caps, very cheap, available from the hardware stores. I drill an appropriate size hole in it. I unthread the nut from the battery terminal put this little thing on and put the, put the uh, nut back on. Now anything that rolls past there can't contact the uh, terminals accidentally. You need to observe the proper charging regimen. Each battery has a recommended charge regimen from its manufacturer. You should follow that. Uh, in the case of the lithium iron phosphate batteries that I mentioned earlier, they come with or can be had with a specific size charger that is made for that battery. I strongly recommend that you spend a few extra dollars, get the right charger for that battery, and use it. It will last longer and it will be safer. You need to use wire that is appropriately sized for the load. American wire gauges kind of work backward. The larger the number, the smaller the wire. The smaller the number, the larger or fatter the wire. Fat wire is good. It's a lot of copper, but there are good reason for using it. Imagine you were trying to empty your swimming pool with some quarter-inch aquarium tubing. Wouldn't work. It'd take forever and it would really be ineffective. And that's the same kind of situation as you're trying to run a large load with very thin wire. And it's just, it, not only is it not going to be effective, you'll have voltage loss, but also that wire will get hot. And it could get hot enough to start a fire. That's why you have circuit breakers at homes, and that's why, at least in older construction, uh, the house wiring was inside conduit. Because when too much current flows through that wire, it can get very hot. So use big, fat wire 
Uh, you want something that will not get hot when you're using it in its normal capacity. Make sure that you have some sort of DC rated fuse or circuit breaker close to the power source, close to the battery. Uh, that will stop the flow of current in the event there is an accidental short somewhere down the road. If you happen to use a sloshy electrolyte battery, one of those flooded batteries that I mentioned earlier, uh, make sure you charge them only outdoors. In fact, I would keep them outdoors all the time. They really shouldn't be inside your house or your building. Uh, you want to avoid any splashes or spills. You don't have it up on a table where an earthquake could dump it. Uh, keep it in the upright position. But again, I really don't recommend these at all. They're the cheapest op option, but uh, not really the best option. Let's talk about generating your own power. Um, there are all sizes of generators that can be used. The whole house generators uh, can produce enough to basically run your entire house, uh, maybe, you know, obviously charge some batteries if you need it along the way. But uh, you need permits for that, inspections. It has to be installed by a qualified technician. Uh, you must use a transfer switch. Uh, you think of the old, uh, uh, the old horror movies where some mad scientist is pulling this big knife switch from one position to another. That is actually a transfer switch. Yours may not look quite as macabre, but uh, that's what it does. It makes sure that the power cannot go to both the line and the generator at the same time. You do not want any back feed for a number of reasons. The most important one is uh, if you've got the power out in the area and some poor lineman is trying to fix the line and your generator power is going back up the line, you could kill him. Now that should be a reason enough. But also, uh, connected to that same line are all your neighbors. And your generator will not only be trying to run your house, but your neighbor's house. And uh, uh, that won't last very long. You'll overload the generator very quickly. You will also need adequate fuel storage in a safe location. Now, some of the more rural areas of the valley here uh, are not connected to the uh, gas company's lines. They may be running everything off propane. In that case, a propane generator might make a lot of sense. Otherwise, you'll be storing some sort of liquid fuel. Uh, and again, it has to be in proper containers in a safe area. Gas-powered generators also come in small portable sizes. Those can be great for this sort of situation. A portable generators are much more affordable than a whole house system. They can run selected loads. They don't have to run your whole house. Maybe they run the refrigerator uh, and a couple of key lights and so on. Uh, use, again, an adequately sized extension cord for the purpose. As we said before, even with a portable generator, do not connect it to your house wiring. You could kill a lineman. And again, you need adequate safe fuel storage. When you're running a generator, it may be, say, a two kilowatt model. Well, you may not need all two kilowatts at that point. If you have excess power being generated, that'd be a good time to get your battery charger out and take the batteries you've been using at night and run them. You don't necessarily have to run the generator all day. You can run it for a few hours to get your refrigerator freezer back to cold, and that'll stretch your fuel supply. And as long as it's running, then you can put some of those battery chargers on and bring everything up uh, to a full charge again before you have to shut it off. Uh, let's talk about generator safety. First, absolutely keep the exhaust away from any enclosed areas. And that means not just outside the door or outside the window, but far away. Uh, for the size of engine, they generate a lot more carbon monoxide, which is the stuff that will kill you, than a car engine, which is uh, actually pretty clean for its size uh, because of all the uh, environmental requirements. Next, store that fuel in a safe container, not old milk jugs or anything else. Use proper containers, keep it in a safe location away from dry brush. If it doesn't have a good spark arrestor on it, and a Forest Service approved spark arrestor is a, a pretty good uh, benchmark, uh, make sure you add one to it. Most of the modern ones have it. Have a fire extinguisher and know how to use it. Okay, having an extinguisher sitting there that you've never tried, that you haven't practiced with, uh, isn't helping you much when you really need it. There are plenty of uh, uh, events here uh, related to CERT. Many of you have probably taken CERT training. Uh, one of the things you learn there is the proper use of a fire extinguisher. Having somebody back you up and watch you. Uh, the uh, pull, aim, squeeze, sweep at the base of the fire. 
know how to use it properly. Avoid refueling your generator when the engine is hot. Gasoline is very volatile when it's vapor, and it's vapor when it's hot. So pouring gasoline onto a hot engine could start a fire. So let it cool down 10 minutes or so before you do refueling. Now some of the more modern uh, portable generators have uh, plastic cowlings around them that will basically prevent that from happening. But the open frame type, you certainly could accidentally spill onto the engine, so you don't want to do that. Let's talk about solar. Think of it as a, a really big electrical current source that isn't very well regulated. You can get small, channel, uh, small panels that will recharge a small device. You can get larger panels that will maybe recharge one of your deep cycle batteries. You can have a rooftop system with inverters that will run the whole house. Typical photovoltaic panel, which is what we call it, will produce anywhere from 5 to 18 watts per square foot, uh, depending on how it's built. Let's look at different kinds of panels here. As luck would have it, the ones that tend to be most efficient are those big, large, uh, fixed panels uh, that you may find on a roof or on a big uh, movable stand somewhere. The little fold-up ones, the roll-up ones, tend to be less efficient, although they're certainly convenient. Photovoltaic or solar panels come in a number of nominal voltages. It could be 12 volt, 24, or 48 volt panels. Make sure you know what you're getting. A 24 volt panel cannot work in a 12 volt system. You'll burn things up. Now, those voltages, by the way, are just nominal voltages. The actual unloaded voltage that comes out of a so-called 12 volt panel could be over 20 volts. For that reason, you never want to connect the output of a solar panel directly to your equipment. You always run it through something called a charge controller, and from there, preferably into a battery, and from there to your loads. That way, your equipment will be getting the proper voltage. That's it for the formal presentation. I did want to show you something. I mentioned earlier uh, putting some equipment together to have your own uh, power source for a piece of equipment. Uh, this is something I built. Uh, it's an ammo can, but it has one of those lithium iron phosphate batteries in it. In this case, it's uh, 20 amp hours. And flip it on, I can monitor the voltage. I have two USB ports, each good for a couple of amps, so I could charge quite a few cell phones with this, or iPads, or whatever it may be. I also have over here a automotive uh, what we call cigarette lighter outlet, and something that we use as amateurs, uh, it's Anderson Power Poles. It's a proprietary connector that's really very handy. I have most of my equipment there. So if you have a battery set up, you can use that with, this is basically one of those DC voltage converters that I mentioned uh, much earlier in the presentation, except this one is designed to mount on a panel, and we have uh, the five volts coming out of it, which is just what these, uh, these iPhones and other devices need. So with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the fair. Uh, I'd like to thank the Valley Disaster Preparedness Fair for allowing me to present to you today, and uh, please stay safe. Thanks.